Well, good evening. Good evening. I'll see two or three more times. So, it's good to see everyone, and uh, welcome to another session of the Alpha Omega Conference. I was able to take in some of the morning sessions, and it's a blessing and an encouragement as always, isn't it? Thinking God's thoughts after him as we study scripture. I mean, what a joy and a privilege. There should be nothing that warms our hearts like studying God's truth and then applying it in our lives. I remind you, if you have a cell phone like I do, I just turn that on silent tonight. And uh, tonight we have with us Dr. George Gunn, uh, friends of most of us, probably most of us know him, works at Shasta Bible College, has for many, many years um, in a variety of capacities, and we deeply appreciate him and his faithful ministry to the Lord. And he'll explain a little bit more of stepping into Phil Dr. Ice's slot tonight, but he'll be speaking on replacement theology, as you can see on the slide. So let's pray, and uh, then we'll turn it over to him to get started. Our Father, we do give you thanks because you are good and you are awesome, you are holy and you are loving, and we especially appreciate that when it comes to uh, your truth, you have given it to us in written form. 
in a form in scripture that we can read and we can understand, in a form that uh, then we can teach and preach and that transforms our lives through your Holy Spirit applying it to us. We thank you, Lord, that even though you might have left us in the dark when it comes to matters of the end times or matters in the past, creation, you didn't. And even the theme of this conference reminds us of the beginning and the end and how you hold all these things together in your hands, but in your grace and in your love for us, you've chosen to reveal these truths to us. So we count it a privilege to know them, to know you, to know the one that is eternal life, Christ our Savior. So Lord, bless our time this evening here and in the other sessions in Reading. Might we be drawn to you. Might our lives be encouraged and strengthened. Might we give you glory as a result. In these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Gunn. Thank you, Benjamin. And uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, this will be a real blessing. Um, we are really, really enjoying this year's Alpha Omega Conference, our 17th on um, biblical creation and end times prophecy. That's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And God has blessed us with some tremendous speakers this year. Uh, tonight here at Grace Baptist Church, you're supposed to be listening to Dr. Tommy Ice speaking on the subject of the rapture before Darby. I am not Dr. Tommy Ice, and I'm not going to speak on the rapture before Darby. Um, we thought perhaps we could get somebody to take the same topic, and I'll be honest with you, the rapture before Darby is something I would love to present to you. But we only found out just a very few days before the conference began that Dr. Tommy Ice had, and had um, uh, come across some health issues that to, would not allow him to come. And we've been scrambling ever since to try to cover those bases where he was going to speak. And um, Dr. Nicholas asked me if I could take the, the topic, the rapture before Darby, uh, for tonight's session. I said, you know, I would love to do that, but I don't think I have enough time ready to prepare adequately for that. But what I do want to do is um, talk to you just briefly about that subject and recommend a couple of great books. Uh, there has been a lot of material that has come out in the last several years relating to uh, the rapture before Darby. And the first one that came out that really caught my attention, and I enjoyed reading this so much, is by William C. Watson. Bill Watson just went to home to be with the Lord just a, a couple of months ago. But he, he wrote this book entitled Dispensationalism Before Darby. When Dr. Watson was writing his uh, PhD dissertation, he was focused, his specialty was English literature of the uh, 17th and 18th century. It's a pretty narrow field. But, uh, and he wasn't writing on the subject of the rapture, but as a Christian in a secular university working on this dissertation, he was reading all these British authors of the 16th and 17th centuries, and he kept coming across passage after passage after passage that sounded just like dispensational teaching. Pre-tribulation rapture, regathering of the nation of Israel in the end times, and all these things, and he thought, well, now that's odd. I've always heard that uh, dispensationalism was invented by John Nelson Darby. And so he actually asked his uh, dissertation advisor if he could write his thesis on that topic. Well, being a, a secular university, he was told, well, that probably would not be very smart for you to write on uh, at this time. So he did. He held off for years. And after he graduated, he kept researching this. And he has brought together these, um, these quotations, mostly from British authors, some from the Netherlands and some from the United States, from the um, uh, 17th and 18th centuries, all detailing um, very, very dispensational teachings from before the time of Darby. 
Now, those who are non-dispensational to this day still put forth the untruth that dispensationalism was invented by John Nelson Darby and is no more recent than that. Uh, today, that is, it is inexcusable for anybody to try to use that argument because it has been abundantly documented, not only by Bill Watson, but by many other authors that both the pre-tribulation rapture, as well as premillennialism, as well as Zionism, the regathering of Israel in the last days uh, before the kingdom, all of that was taught uh, abundantly way long before John Nelson Darby at about 1800. So anyway, that's one book I would highly recommend if you're interested in the topic, Bill Watson, Dispensationalism Before Darby, and I think you'll really enjoy reading those excerpts. Another one that came out just a little bit after this is by James Morris. It's a much smaller book, but uh, still a, a great one, and you should know about it here because your pastor is familiar with this. Uh, pastor John actually gave me this copy. But Ancient Dispensational Truth. Ancient Dispensational Truth. And in this book, um, Dr. Morris goes way back to the early days of the history of the church, back to the patristic era, and he documents from the early fathers, early church fathers, again, very, very much dispensational thinking. So if you're interested in the topic, um, we will uh, just leave you with these two books uh, as a recommendation. This is James Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, James Morris, and the title is Ancient Dispensational Truth. Okay? All right. So that's all you get of Tommy Ice tonight. And now you get to hear uh, uh, Pastor George Gunn talking about replacement theology, which actually is very closely related to this whole idea. We'll actually touch on the topic that I've just been uh, speaking about uh, in part of this. But I want to start by asking a question. Uh, does the nation of Israel play a key role in God's plans for the future? Well, the apostles thought so very clearly, and we'll show that this evening. But throughout the most of the history of the church, Christians have denied any significance to national Israel. Now, that all began to change when Israel became a modern nation in 1948. But then in more recent days, that um, uh, increasing numbers of Christians actually have gone back to what I would call a pre-1948 mindset and are again denying that there are any significant uh, places in God's future plans for a national Israel. And we are encountering, encountering this more and more in what we would call evangelical Christianity. For example, as we think about this question now, uh, John Piper has said that the Abrahamic covenant is a conditional covenant. And that, that since the rejection of Jesus was, in his words, the ultimate act of covenant breaking, that therefore Israel has no legal claim either to the land of Israel or to the future kingdom. So that is John Piper, who is a very popular evangelical teacher today. And many people follow John Piper and hang on his every word. Not only does he make that claim, but uh, he also reflects similar thinking in the way that he describes the origin of Christianity. And Piper said this, and I'll quote from him. He said, Christianity began pushed out of Judaism by those who rejected Jesus as the Christ. And we could probably agree with him up to that point, but now listen to the last part of the sentence. He said, but in God's sight, referring to Christians, heirs of the promise and possessors of the kingdom. So in John Piper's view, because Israel rejected Jesus at the first covenant, God said, okay, I'm cutting you out of the covenant. And in your place, I'm going to put the Christians, and the Christians are receiving the promises made to Israel. 
well, what about this? What does the Bible have to say about all this? Well, let me share a couple of passages out of Romans. In the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11 form a unit that is describing uh, in New Testament terminology what has happened to God's program for Israel. And if we pick up this thread in chapter 10, verse 21, the last verse of the chapter, what I'm going to do is going to, I'm going to ignore the chapter break because the chapter breaks, as you know, are not inspired. They really are put there more for convenience so that we can keep up with each other in church and the pastor you know, can tell you what chapter and verse to go to. But <clears throat> this all kind of goes together. Watch this in verse 21. But as for Israel, he says, all day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Now that's a quote from Isaiah 65. And Paul quotes that to, to refer to the attitude of Israel towards their covenant God. They were what? They were an obstinate people and a disobedient people. And so you might think, like the replacement theologians, that therefore God will just wipe his hands clean of them. But what does it go on to say? Verse 1 of chapter 11, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. And the Apostle Paul here used a very strong negative expression. In other words, the thought that God might have rejected his people is so far from our minds that we can't even entertain the thought. And he follows that up by his, this kind of reasoning. He says, for I too am an Israelite. Okay, Paul was a Jew, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Now, if we just drop down a little bit further in the same chapter, Romans chapter 11, verse 11, it, Paul says this, I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And here's that same very strong negative, may it never be. So did Israel stumble? Yes, absolutely they stumbled. When Jesus the Messiah came and offered them the kingdom, they rejected that offer. And that was a stumble. Paul says, did they stumble so as to fall? And the, ab the answer is absolutely no. They did not stumble so as to fall. But listen to what it did accomplish. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. For which you and I can say, thank you to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is the riches, riches of the world and their failure the riches of the Gentiles, how much more will their what? Their fulfillment be. So while there might be a stumble in the past, there might be a continuing stubbornness and obstinacy in the present, there is coming in the future what Paul referred to as their fulfillment. And their fulfillment is the fulfillment of God's covenant promises to that nation. Look at verse 13. I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? but life from the dead. So there is coming sometime in the future that Paul refers to as their acceptance. And he also calls it life from the dead. And I believe what Paul is referring to here when he refers to this life from the dead is the prophecy we read about back in Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones. And you remember those bones come together? and they get sinews on them, and muscle, and flesh, and there's this body lying there, but it has no breath in it. Until a second phase of this prophecy comes, and God breathes into this body the breath of life, and it comes to life. And Ezekiel tells us this is talking about the restoration of the nation of Israel in prophetic times. That is life from the dead, and it is Israel coming to life both physically and spiritually. 
Well, this is all kind of based on God's promise to Abraham that begins in Genesis chapter 12. I want to look at the version of it that occurs in Genesis chapter 13. And in Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15, we find Abraham now in a place in the Holy Land called Bethel. Bethel is just a few miles to the north of Jerusalem. If you look on a map of Israel today, Jerusalem was right smack dab in the center of the country of Israel. It's right in the middle of the Holy Land. So this is approximately where Abraham was, just a few miles north of there. With that in our minds, think about this verse. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are. Look north, look south, look east, and look west for all of the land that you see. And you can see all of the promised land of Israel from that location on a clear day. All of the land that you see, I will give it to you and your descendants until you reject my Messiah at his first coming. No, it doesn't say that, does it? I give it to you and your descendants for how long? Forever. Forever. And it is an eternal promise from God. God's covenant with the descendants of Abraham is an eternal covenant. I want to talk about that a little bit. It cannot be canceled, violated, or broken. It is a commitment of the eternal God to his chosen people. Now think with me a little bit about what kind of a God it is who makes an eternal covenant. It is an eternal God who makes an eternal covenant. I love this verse, this couple of verses in Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. And uh, it reads this way, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, when was that? It was way back in the early days of creation. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even, what, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, the truth of eternity expressed in this verse is way too much for my finite mind to comprehend. God has created us in his likeness and image, and there is a kind of eternity that pertains to humanity because our lives will never end. Our lives will go on forever and ever, either in heaven or in hell, but our lives are eternal in that respect. But think about this. While there is an eternity of man, there is an eternity of God that is infinitely greater than man's eternity. Because whereas we don't have an end, we did have a beginning. God has neither beginning nor end. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And this is the God that we love, the God that we serve, the God that we worship tonight. Only God is truly eternal. Uh, eternality is what we call in theology an incommunicable attribute. Now, some of the attributes of God, he can communicate to his creatures. His love, his intelligence, his compassion, his um, purity. But eternity is something that cannot be given to creatures. When God spoke the universe into existence, time came into existence. And all of creation is subject to time. But God himself remains outside of time and is not bound by time in any way at all. Man, on the other hand, you and me, as created beings, are time-bound and changeable. But God himself is free from time and is changeless. Because of this, <laughs> as we so well know, man's promises might be broken, but God's promises are never broken. You know, it's true that a man might um, tell his lover, I will love you forever. 
But unfortunately, that can change with time. With the passing of time, there might come disappointments over failures to act in a certain way. And the I will love you forever uh, just might change into divorce papers. Now, we don't like to see that, do we? But it is the reality. Man does not make eternal promises. Well, he might make eternal promises, but there's no guarantee that men will keep eternal promises. But God, being eternal, is the only one who can truly make eternal promises. And this is why a verse like this is so precious to us as believers in Christ in 1 John 2.25. This is the promise which he himself has made to us. And what is the promise? Eternal life. Eternal life. See, God made eternal promises to Israel. He has also made eternal promises to the church. They're not necessarily the same promises, but it's the same eternal God who is making these eternal promises. And he can do that because he is eternal. And he can be trusted to fulfill his promises because he's an eternal God. He is, again, from everlasting to everlasting. And this really brings us to, to our topic for tonight, and that is the topic of replacement theology. You see, we can put it this way. If the eternal God, if we grant replacement theology for the sake of the argument, okay, if the eternal God made an eternal promise to Israel and now through Israel's disobedience has changed his mind and given Israel's promise to someone else, if that were the case, then how can he be trusted? So this is why this topic is of importance to us tonight. Uh, you may not be a Jewish person. You may not be part of the nation of Israel. Maybe it doesn't matter to you personally whether or not God has a program for Israel in the future. But it ought to matter to you. Because if the eternal God made a promise to Israel and doesn't keep it, then what guarantee to you and I have that the eternal God who's promised us eternal life will keep that promise? So it is vitally important to us today. So let's, let's start with the definition of some terms. We're talking about replacement theology. The, the more technical term for this is called supersessionism. Now they mean the same thing. You can call it replacement theology, you can call it supersessionism. Supersessionism is the theologically accurate term. Replacement theology is sort of the popular term that's been used in recent days to describe this. But supersessionism is the view that the New Testament church is the new Israel that has forever superseded national Israel as the people of God. And uh, that might sound strange to you, especially I know the folks at Grace Baptist Church here in Reading have been schooled and instructed uh, correctly and that this is probably totally foreign to your thinking. But I'll tell you something, that this statement right here has been the majority position of Christianity from the time of Justin Martyr throughout most of the 19th century, sad to say. Uh, the 20th century witnessed a significant change to this position and uh, bringing us really to our dispensational view of Israel. And the two things that brought about this change in the 20th century were, were number one, the popularity of dispensational teaching and preaching in the churches. And people began looking to God fulfilling his promises literally the promises that he made to Israel in the, in the Old Testament. So the popularity of dispensational teaching. The second thing that uh, brought about a significant change in the 20th century was the creation of the modern state of Israel in 1948. Back before 1948, frankly, it was pretty easy to be a replacement theologian. There was nothing in Israel. 
It was a rundown, desolate place that had been abandoned pretty much by the Ottoman Empire. It had uh, just uh, gone to uh, desolation. Uh, Mark Twain visited um, Israel and wrote about it in his diary, and he described it as a God-forsaken place that nobody would want to, to uh, visit. And that's how it was in his day. Quite different today if you've ever visited Israel. How many here have been to, the, have been to Israel? Several of you have, and you know what I'm talking about. So the creation of the modern state of Israel made it easy to understand, to comprehend how God can now fulfill his promises to Israel, literally. And so following 1948, many people, many Christians started abandoning um, replacement theology. But unfortunately, um, supersessionism has seen something of a revival in the last few years. So supersessionism is the technical name. Replacement theology is uh, the equivalent name. And uh, recent literature has uh, said much about replacement theology. Now, as we're, as we're defining this, let me say this, that as I have studied replacement theology, I have detected that there are two um, forms of replacement theology that we find today. And I would call them a strong form and a mild form. The strong form of supersessionism has the following attributes. Number one, they believe that the church completely and forever replaces Israel and receives Israel's Old Testament promises spiritually. So again, they say that when Jesus came the first time and the Jews didn't receive Christ, God said, nope, I'm done with you. But it didn't stop there. The replacement theologians say God put the church in the place of Israel to replace them but then there's a problem because many of the promises that God made to Israel are tied to the land of Israel. And you remember Genesis 13, Abraham looked north, south, east, and west. All the land that you see, I have given it to you. So in what sense does the church receive the land? Well, notice the last part of this point. The church receives Israel's Old Testament promises how? Spiritually, spiritual. I'll give you an example of this. When Israel first came into the land as a nation, it was after the Exodus. Okay, we just had Passover and the celebration of the Exodus. They came across through the wilderness for 40 years and God brought them into the promised land. How? Across the Jordan River. So think about how often you've heard in Christian hymnody and in spiritual songs and things, references to what? To Christian death as what? Crossing the Jordan. And, you know, it's not just crossing the Jordan. It's always got to be old, chilly Jordan, right? For some reason, it's always old and it's always chilly. But that, you know, metric meter fits the songs better, I think. But uh, crossing old chilly Jordan to enter into the promised land means dying and going to heaven. And this is how the church then receives Israel's promises spiritually. And over and over and over again, the different components of God's promises to national Israel and the Old Testament prophets that is spiritualized, given a non-literal meaning and applied to the church. And so those theologians say, see, we have all those promises and we are the true Israel of God. Well, <clears throat> the strong form of supersessionism, secondly, believes that the, uh, was the majority position of the church throughout most of church history, and we'll touch on some of those historians in just a moment. Thirdly, we could say that there are two possible explanations in strong supersessionism uh, uh, to explain even why there is an Israel. I mean, you would wonder why does God even bother having an Israel if God who knows all things knew that they were gonna reject Christ and he's all done with them now. What is a strong supersessionist explanation for Israel's existence? And there are two, two ways that they explain this. Number one, uh, they say that, well, Israel violated God's covenant, and so God has finally and forever condemned Israel, and Israel is this kind of object of God's 
condemnation and anger and ire and wrath. And that's supposed to be some kind of a message to um, the rest of the world. And that is one way that supersessionists explain Israel's existence. A second way that they explain it is uh, there are some who simply say that Old Testament only served as a type of the church. And the only reason Israel existed as the people of God in the Old Testament was to serve as a type. And once the church came into existence, there's just really no uh, rational reason for Israel to continue existing. So this is what I would call um, strong supersessionism, this view. Uh, there is another form that I would call mild supersessionism, and it has several uh, attributes as well. Now, the first point is pretty much shared with strong supersessionism. Mild supersessionism also believes that the church replaces Israel and receives Israel's Old Testament promises spiritually. So they have that in common, and that's really essentially what we mean by replacement theology. But um, in mild supersessionism, they do believe that there is a future salvation for Israel. These theologians have read about God doing something in Israel in the end times. And taking that seriously, they say, well, there, there is something here. There's going to be a mass um, salvation of Jewish people in the end times. However, uh, ethnic Israel gets saved but in mild supersessionism, there is no national restoration. And as I listen to these guys teach and preach and I read their works, this is kind of a, a litmus test for me. When I hear somebody referring time and again to ethnic Israel, immediately I suspect, here's a mild supersessionist. Now that isn't always the case. But oftentimes it is if they talk about ethnic Israel. Somebody who truly believes that God is going to faithfully fulfill his promises to Israel will use the expression national Israel. Because this is really what's at stake. Is God going to reconstitute Israel as a nation? And will that nation be a special favored people of God in the millennial messianic kingdom? And a mild supersessionist will say, well, Jews can get saved, but they're only get, gonna get saved so they can get added to the church. And we believe um, that the scripture teaches clearly that Israel and the church are two distinct entities. They are not the same thing. In much of Reformed theology, the church is the New Testament Israel, and Israel was the Old Testament church, and they're basically all just kind of one thing. But the Bible teaches that the church and Israel are two distinct entities, the church coming into existence on the day of Pentecost with the descent of the Holy Spirit to baptize believers into the body of Christ. Jesus has been building that body, the church, now for almost 2,000 years ever since that day. But there is coming a day when the church will be completed. And at that time, when the church is completed, the Bible tells us that Jesus will take his bride and catch us up to the Father's house at the event we call the rapture. Once that happens, God, who has set Israel aside temporarily for this period of time, will turn his attention once again to Israel. And the very first Jewish people who will get saved after the church is removed from the earth, I believe, are the 144,000 that we read about in Revelation chapter 7. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. These 144,000 Jewish evangelists will set the world on fire for Christ and multitudes will come to faith through their witness and testimony from every tribe and nation and tongue and people. Both of Jews and Gentiles will come to faith in Jesus. Now most of them will be martyred in the tribulation period because that's what the tribulation period is going to present to mankind, that kind of a world. But praise God, they will get saved, but they'll get saved through that Jewish witness. And then, of course, after the second coming, then that nation will be completely reconstituted as a nation saved 
by the new covenant that God makes with them. And they will be a special people of God throughout the thousand years of the kingdom. But in replacement theology, mild supersessionism has Jewish people getting saved but simply added to the church. And that's kind of the difference between mild supersessionism and what we would believe about Israel. Um, so let's, let's think about supersessionism through the ages. From the apostolic time up until the present, what do we find? Well, if we go back to the very earliest days of the church in Acts chapter 1, even just before the church began, what did the apostles believe? They believed in a reconstituted nation of Israel for the kingdom. Now, I don't have this up on screen, but in chapter 1, verse 3, Acts 1, verse 3, we read that after Jesus' resurrection, he was with his disciples for 40 days. And Acts 1, 3 tells us that during those 40 days, he was specifically teaching them about the kingdom of God. Now, think of it. Wouldn't you have loved to have been in that classroom? 40 days with the resurrected Christ teaching about the kingdom of God. After 40 days of instruction about the kingdom of God, look at what, they asked, what the disciples asked the Lord in verse 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? After 40 days of instruction, the disciples thought that the Lord was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Now, let's just assume for the sake of the argument that Jesus taught replacement theology, because that's what the replacement theologians would believe. Let's suppose that Jesus had taught his disciples for 40 days that the kingdom of God was no longer going to be an earthly, spirit, earthly literal kingdom, but it's going to be a spiritualized kingdom. And this new thing, the church, is going to receive Israel's promises. How would Jesus have answered this question? You know, he would have said, I think, something like this. You knuckleheads. No, he wouldn't have said knuckleheads, but I would. Uh, he would have used something more appropriate for the Son of God. But I'll go ahead and say, you knuckleheads, don't you remember? I've been, just been telling you for 40 days that the kingdom is spiritual. It's not literal. It's not on the earth. And it's not for the nation of Israel. But he didn't answer them that way. When they asked Jesus if he at this time was going to restore the kingdom to Israel, he said this in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. The apostles were exactly right about thinking that God would restore the kingdom to Israel. The only thing that they were left wondering about was the timing. Now we can go on and look at Acts chapter 15, a little ways into the church, and here the apostle James is speaking at the so-called Jerusalem council, and notice what James said at this time. He said, with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written, and he now is going to quote from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, and here's the quotation. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. Now, what is the tabernacle of David? The tabernacle of David is the house of David. And you might recall from 2 Samuel chapter 7, Psalm 89, and so forth, that God made another eternal promise, this time not to Abraham, but to David. And the promise was that from the descendants of David, there would always be someone who could rule over Israel from the throne of David. Now, the throne of David is a throne that rests in the city of David, Jerusalem, the city that David conquered from the uh, Jebusites and made the capital of Israel. That's where the throne of David resides. And there was always a Davidic descendant sitting on that throne up until the Babylonian captivity. When Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city of Jerusalem and deported the Jews to Babylon, the tabernacle of David fell. 
Now, there was still someone qualified to sit on that throne, but there was no longer a throne in Jerusalem. And Amos foresees a time in the future when God will return and will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. Now, I'll tell you this, when Jesus came the first time, that's exactly what he offered to Israel. He presented himself as the king of Israel, as the Messiah. And if they had repented at his teaching and had accepted him as the Messiah, they could have had the kingdom. But of course, they rejected him. That did not result in Israel's fall, however. It only resulted in Israel's stumble, a postponement of that kingdom until the second coming. And at the second coming, just as Amos said, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. So there's no doubt that the apostles believed in a future national restoration of Israel for the kingdom. And the apostle Paul, as we've already seen, we took a look at this verse at the beginning of, of this talk, Paul says, I say then they didn't stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. If their transgression is the riches of the world and their failure the riches of the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So this is the position among the apostles. But let's move on a little bit. Not very much, just into the early part of the second century. After the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans, Jews were forced out of the land of Israel. The Romans brought many Gentiles into the land, and they populated the land. Now many of these Gentiles responded to the gospel and were saved. And the church in the land of Israel began to take on a more Gentile um, appearance. Among these Gentile believers now living in the land of Israel was a man by the name of Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr's years are 110 to 165. And as far as we can tell, Justin Martyr is the earliest Christian evidence we have of replacement theology. <clears throat> Justin wrote a, um, a work called A Dialogue with Trypho the Jew, in which he engages this man named Trypho in a, in a dialogue, a discussion about the gospel. And it's Justin's effort to win Trypho to faith in Christ. Among Justin's words to Trypho are these, quote, the true spiritual Israel, the descendants of Judah, Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, who in uncircumcision was approved of and blessed by God on account of his faith and called the father of many nations, are what? Are we who have been led to God through this crucified Christ? So he says, we Gentiles who have believed in Jesus, we are the true spiritual Israel. And down through the ages of the church, this expression, the true spiritual Israel, or alternately the true Israel of God, has been used by replacement theologians as a description of the church. And we think it began here with uh, Trypho, or with Justin Martyr in his dialogue with Trypho. Justin also said this, quote, As therefore Christ is the Israel and the Jacob, even so we who have been quarried out of the bowels of Christ are the true Israelitic race. So there you have then um, uh, the beginning, I think, of uh, replacement theology. Well, we can move on a little bit more. If we go down to Alexandria, Egypt, there was a very, very uh, popular and famous early church father by the name of Origen, or Oregon. Um, according to Origen, Israel had been, quote, abandoned because of their sins. Okay, that's the constant uh, statement of all replacement theologians. Israel abandoned because of their sins. 
And because of that, Origen said, they will never be restored to their former condition. That's hardcore replacement theology. Never again be restored to their former condition, for they committed a crime of the most unhallowed kind in conspiring against the savior of the human race in that city where they offered up to God a worship containing the symbols of mighty mysteries. So here we find now uh, the, the replacement theology of Justin Martyr beginning to spread. We find this taught by Origen. If we move into the Middle Ages, we can look at one of the most famous of all um, uh, Christian theologians, St. Augustine. Yes? Can we say that Origen was wrong? Yes, we can say that Origen was absolutely wrong. Absolutely, yes. And that's what, I'm, that's what I'm illustrating here, is that what started out right in the eyes of the apostles very early was corrupted in the church, beginning with Justin Martyr, continuing with Origen, and going on with Augustine. Augustine said, if we hold with a firm heart the grace of God which hath been given us, we are Israel, the seed of Abraham. So Augustine was saying, we Gentiles are the Israel of God. We are Israel. That's replacement theology. The church is replacing Israel. Another Middle Ages uh, theologian was uh, Aquinas. And if you're at all familiar with, with medieval uh, theology, you've, you've come across uh, the name of Aquinas. Anybody here with any kind of a Roman Catholic background probably knows quite a bit about Aquinas. Aquinas actually was what we might call a mild supersessionist. Uh, he saw a future salvation of all the Jews, but not a national restoration. So there we see mild supersessionism. Let's move on past the Middle Ages and come up to the time of the Protestant Reformation. Now in the Reformation, tremendous things were taking place. People were were returning once again to the study of the Bible. And as they poured over the pages of scripture, one of the first areas that they began to discover their old Catholic church had been wrong in was in the doctrine of salvation. And Martin Luther realized that justification was by faith and by faith alone, not through the sacraments of the church, not through any good works that we can perform, but by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we thank God for the light that God showed to Martin Luther. But uh, many of the reformers, including Martin Luther, did not discover what the Bible was teaching about the future of Israel. And Martin Luther was actually a hardcore supersessionist. Um, Martin Luther in 1543 wrote a tract titled Concerning the Jews and their lies. He wrote that in 1543. Now, the background to this is simply this. I'll, I'll read you a quote from the publishers of an English translation of this tract. And they said, quote, Luther's experience with the Jews was very disappointing. He spent many years trying to experience with the Jew, or many years trying to convert them. Like St. Paul, he gave the Jews the first chance at the gospel, but concluded in later years that his efforts in this direction were futile. So what we find is uh, a little bit later on in the ministry of Luther, he did a little bit of a flip-flop. In his early years, he was reaching out to the Jews. He wanted to win them to faith in Christ. When they refused his message, he turned against them with a, with a vitriol and with a strength and with a, a persecution that's almost unbelievable. Um, he said this, and I've got this up on the, on the slide, quote, the Jews are certainly rejected by God and are not his people anymore, and he is also not their God anymore. Uh, Martin Luther approved of the persecuting of the Jews, the burning down of their synagogues. In fact, um, during the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler uh, boasted that he was, he was grateful for the writings of Martin Luther because it lended support to his efforts. Now, I'm not saying that, that Hitler was a Christian by any means. He was not. 
but he did find in what Martin Luther wrote about the Jews support for his final solution uh, by which some six million Jews were put to death during the Holocaust. And by the way, today is uh, Holocaust Memorial Day and uh, we need to remember that uh, horrifying event that took place during World War II. Okay, um, so continuing on with the Reformation, we've got Martin Luther. We can also talk about John Calvin. John Calvin was a replacement theologian. I would call John Calvin a mild supersessionist. Uh, John Calvin said this, quote, it is impossible that there shall not at length be some remnant of the Jews that come to Christ and obtain that salvation which he has procured. But look at this next sentence. Thus the Jews must at length be collected along with the Gentiles that out of both there may be one fold under Christ. So he's got this future salvation of Jews but bringing them into the church so that along with the church we are one body rather than acknowledging the biblical truth that the church and Israel are separate and distinct entities. Well, at the time of the Reformation, as I said, people were returning to the study of the Bible. and There were some who discovered that the Bible spoke about a future regathering of Israel and reconstitution of the nation as a special people of God. And so at the time of the Reformation, we find this kind of teaching for one among the Anabaptists. Menno Simons, the founder of the Mennonite church, affirmed a future for national Israel. And uh, I find this really interesting. There were two groups at the time of the Reformation who, was, who particularly believed in a restoration of the Jews. Now, they didn't all hold to a restoration of national Israel, but many of them did. Some of them simply saw some kind of a future turning on the part of the Jews to faith in Jesus. But look at these two groups. I think they'll surprise you. They did me. Uh, number one, the English Puritans. And again, I would refer you to... Um, uh, to Bill Watson's book, Dispensationalism Before Darby. He has this thoroughly, thoroughly documented among many of the early English Puritans. They talked about a future restoration of national Israel. They saw that long before Darby. The other group is even more surprising. That is among the, some of the early Dutch Reformed theologians. And I say that's surprising because uh, the Dutch Reformed Church today is thoroughly, thoroughly supersessionist. Into covenant theology, they would have nothing to do with a dispensational approach to um, the, the Bible at all. But in the early days among the Dutch Reformed theologians, many of them saw a future for Israel. Well, this brings us up to today. And uh, today what we are looking at, as I said, is kind of a resurgence uh, in supersessionism, in replacement theology. Here are some of the names of some uh, fairly popular Bible teachers today. Lots of people are reading their blogs, their books, listening to their sermons, and so forth. There are some amillennialists, such as Sam Storms, Matt Chandler, D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson, by the way, for years taught at Trinity Theological Seminary, and every year, dutifully signed their doctrinal statement, which affirms premillennialism, but he didn't believe it. Finally, in 2018, he preached a sermon in which he um, rather boldly and uh, obviously proclaimed himself an amillennialist. But uh, by then, he was so famous and such a well-known uh, person that uh, Trinity uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't fire him or wouldn't fire him. He stayed on there until uh, he retired. Uh, among post-millennialists, R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul was very popular, had a very large following, and still has a large following. Uh, just in this past year, R.C. Sproul went home to be with the Lord and is no longer a post-millennialist. But uh, he, he knows the truth today. And I don't think he was unsaved at all. I, I used to love to listen to R.C. Sproul until he got onto the subject of eschatology, then, you know, that was enough. But uh, he, he was a good preacher, loved the Lord. Well, this is replacement theology. 
Um, the question is, and we, we, we touched on this in the introduction, but the, the question is, does it matter? Is this something worth my attention? And the answer is very simply, yes, it matters. It matters a great deal because that issue here is the issue of God's faithfulness. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, and we are sometimes, aren't we? Yeah. But even if we are faith, faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Another way of saying he cannot deny himself is simply this. God always acts consistent with his attributes. He is an eternal God. And when the eternal God makes an eternal promise, he is faithful to that promise. Now, I'm just about out of time. If I had more time, what I would love to do would be to go through these passages. There, here's a list of the passages most commonly used by replacement theologians to try to give biblical support to their position. You'll just have to take my word for it right now. I have, I have carefully gone through every one of these passages and not a one of them teaches replacement theology. When you look at them in their context and understand them rightly. Um, if you want to read about it, I've got a whole section in my PhD dissertation dealing with this and uh, I'd be more than happy to make that available to you. But uh, we have maybe just a minute or two remaining, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. As we think about replacement theology, what it means for us, um, maybe you've heard replacement theology teaching, um, have some questions. Anybody with a question tonight? Yes. Okay, you're thinking about John Piper and how does he believe that it's conditional? What he does, this is, this is what they do. They go to the, um, uh, the, the requirement of circumcision and they say, since God required Abraham to circumcise his, himself and his, and his male children, that was a requirement that God placed on the covenant, therefore making it conditional. So they, they take that and they kind of run with that and they say it was a conditional covenant so it can be violated and therefore Israel violated it. But you see, we could, you know, the, I understand that, I get that, I, and, and I've wrestled with that, but still God's promise was forever, forever. And that is repeated over and over again. And when the covenant itself was actually made between God and Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, God takes Abraham through this covenant-cutting ceremony in which Abraham is put to sleep and taken out of the picture and God himself comes down in that, that uh, fiery torch and walks through the pieces of the sacrifice, um, making it obvious that this is an unconditional covenant. Yeah, good question. Thank you for that. There was another one. Yeah, Gary. Yes. And still, I don't know if it's in print, you probably would know that, but it is a finest discussion on the main covenants, yeah. which he definitely proves they are all uh, eternal, everlasting, and unconditional. And because of that, you can't do away with Israel because of those conditions. Exactly, yeah. The Basis of the Premillennial Faith by Charles C. Ryer. It's a, it's a little book. And an easy read, like almost anything that Ryrie wrote. Ryrie writes so clear, so concise, so simply. He's able to take these complex ideas and really state them well. And I have that on my bookshelf. I don't know if it's still in print or not, but uh, that is an excellent book. A couple of other books while we're talking about that, if you're interested in pursuing this subject, one of the greatest of all times was written by Alva McLean called The Greatness of the Kingdom. Alva McLean, The Greatness of the Kingdom, not as easy to read as Ryrie, but excellent. Just a wonderful book 
Um, and then more recently, I think uh, many of you may know who Andy Woods is. We've had him here at, at, uh, at our conference. And um, Andy Woods wrote a book on, oh, I can't remember the exact title, but it has the word kingdom in the title. What is it? The Coming, the coming of the Kingdom, okay, by Andy Woods. Uh, uh, kind of an uh, updated uh, version of Alva McLean's book. Uh, that was how he described it to me. Yeah. Yeah, it is characteristic of Reformed theologians. Now, I talked about the Reformation. In the Reformation, there were Reform Reformation-thinking people that uh, discovered the truth of God's covenant promises to Israel. But today, the expression Reformed theology is almost equal or equivalent to what's called covenant theology, which rules out Israel and is definitely um, supersessionist. So today, most of the people who, who adhere to what's known as Reformed theology really are talking about covenant theology. So you would say replacement theology, Reformed theology, and covenant theology is all the three names of the same person? For practical purposes. Well, well covenant theology and Reformed theology is broader than replacement theology. It includes lots of other things. <laughs> But replacement theology is certainly a, 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 an essential component of covenant theology. And for all practical purposes today, when most people are talking about reformed theology, what they're talking about is covenant theology. Now that wasn't historically true. Historically in the Reformation, uh, reformed theology was simply justification by faith. That was the essence of reformed thinking. Um, instead, of the, instead of the sacraments of the church and the good works of, of Christians. Um, but it came to add on more and more things as time progressed, and it kind of morphed into covenant theology. Don't you think, too, that Roman theology that was all millennial and would be replacement theology had a great deal to do with the guys that remained? Absolutely. Absolutely. The reformers came out of Catholicism. So as they came out of Catholicism, they shed a lot of the things that were part of medieval Catholicism, but they shed more and more as time went on, but they, they kept some of it. And some of them, you know, different parts of the Reformation, some are more like Catholicism, some are less like Catholicism. And uh, another book that came out uh, recently, I wish I had brought it, but anyway, talks about uh, dispensationalism really being the, the logical outcome of the Reformation. And so as Reformed type thinking people continued to search the scriptures, they eventually turned their attention to the doctrine of eschatology and they saw that uh, God's got a future for Israel. Once you understand that God has a future for Israel, you see the distinction between Israel and the church much more clearly, and that re recognition of that truth is going to bring you unfailingly to the position we call the pre-tribulation rapture, which is why Darby eventually came to that conclusion. Yeah. In the late 60s, or 70s, there was a so-called Azusa movement. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting you should ask that. I'm, uh, on, on Sunday, I'm going to be out at Cow Creek, Calvary Chapel speaking on the New Apostolic Reformation. And that Azusa movement was part of a, a kind of a more charismatic church movement, which has also adopted a, actually today what it's become is a post-millennialism. But it's also replacement theology, yes, very much so. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange mixture of things because what you find in the New Apostolic Reformation also is kind of, uh, they're, they're kind of intrigued with Israel and give an honored place to Israel. But I don't think they have things quite worked out in their theology to where it makes sense. But they, they are they're taking Israel's promises to themselves uh, very, very, very definitely. Okay, we are out of time. I want to thank you for giving me your attention tonight, and I, I trust and, and pray that this has been beneficial and helpful to you. We're going to dismiss with a word of prayer, and I think there's an offering basket in the back. 
Um, the way that the Alpha Omega Conference um, is able to be hosted every year is just by free will offerings. That's why we make it uh, available to anybody. If you don't uh, have any to give, that's fine. We want you to come for free. But if you can help support us, and uh, we've got uh, great speakers that have come a long way, we need to pay their expenses and hopefully give them a bit of an honorarium, which they deserve, uh, we'd, li we'd like to ask you to, uh, to be generous as God moves you. But let's pray together. Thank you, Father in heaven, for this evening. We pray now for your blessing on us as we go our way. And we pray for a, a wonderful day tomorrow in the conference as well. Pray that you keep everybody in good health and strength. We pray for Tommy Ice tonight. Pray that you'd raise him up and uh, restore him to health and, and to profitable ministry for the Lord until Jesus comes. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.